Hello, and welcome to another Piper Pod. Today we're going to continue the patient examination theme, and we're going to talk about the dipstick urinalysis. And more importantly, we're going to analyse the dipstick urinalysis. The reason we chose this one in particular is I have a lot of work colleagues, a lot of people in the past that have told me that they have no idea what's being tested or what numbers to look for or how anything correlates with the actual person. It's also something that as medics or in the field we can use as an awesome screening tool for further testing. So I think it's in our best interest to have a good understanding of the actual urinalysis that we're conducting so we can make the best clinical decisions. Things that we need to be aware of whilst conducting the urinalysis is the dipstick urinalysis is only used as a means to flag potential patients that need to go get further laboratory testing. So if you have a urinalysis that is completely negative, around 5 to 10% of those can have a positive laboratory test. Okay, so it's not actually a percent. And as we talk about later, there's certain aspects of the urinalysis that even have very less sensitivity in certain areas. So, so just be aware that this is not a laboratory testing and it can urine can be taken away for further testing. And if you have any flags associated with the urinalysis, it should be sent away for further testing. Next big thing to realize is timing is everything. So when you're doing a urinalysis, you start from the bottom line being glucose and you work your way up to the top being leukocytes. The reason for that is it requires a certain amount of time before the actual strip can be activated. So if you dip it in, shake it off and read it straight away, you may as well not do it. Okay? You need to wait the time that is written on the bottle for each particular one before you can take a reading. If you wait too long, okay, you will get an absolute false negative or a false positive with the, with the urinalysis because as urine stays on the actual dipstick too long, so greater than three minutes before you test it, it actually ruins the contrast and again you may as well not do it. Okay, So timing is absolutely everything when doing this, so if you're going to do a urinalysis, make sure you do it properly. Okay? Best chance for the best results. When you finish doing your urinalysis, take a step back and have a look at the big picture. Okay, It's not just about writing the numbers down to put into your chart, but look at the numbers, look at how they correlate, and think about the patient. Okay, think about what the patient has been telling you, and think about additional questions that you can ask in order to get more information. That's things to consider. Right now to the actual analysis of the urine itself. When you get a urine test, before you put a dipstick in, you can have a look at a certain number of characteristics that can help pretty much isolate the sort of thing that you're going to look for. Okay, so the smell of the urine, whilst none of us enjoy it, okay, if you do then it's probably something a little bit wrong with you, you can tell a lot of clinical information from the smell. So if the urine smells like feces, then you actually more than likely have intestinal bladder connection through a fistula okay so that's a very very bad thing so you need to have a smell and if it does smell like feces then it definitely needs to be passed up if the urine has a sweet acetone sort of smell okay it can be indicative to diabetic ketoacidosis okay we always talk about the acetone breath because of the huge concentration of glucose in this in the um, in the body it's obviously going to be excreted through the kidneys as well okay so sweet smells can denote ketoacidosis. A smell of ammonia is generally associated with an alkaline fermentation. Okay, so we all know what that ammonia smells like, especially anyone who has cats. Okay, it's highly alkaline urine. When looking at your actual urine, take a look at the colour. Okay, if you have that bright urine that most people are associated with vitamin tablets, particular vitamin B, just realise that it may not be vitamin B tablets, it can also be a low concentration of bilirubin as well, which we'll talk about later. Obviously red denotes blood, hemoglobin within it, okay, but it can also denote someone's eating a lot of beetroots. Okay, so always ask the person 
about their diet when doing these urinalysis. We've mentioned that a lot. Now, dark bot brown in the past, we've always talked about rhabdomyolysis, dark brown, obviously, medical emergency, big things to pick up. They can also be present in people that are taking iron supplements. Okay, so they can have really dark brown urine that you may get really nervous about, but it's just because they overdosed a little bit on these iron supplements. Okay, urine, regardless of colour, should be transparent. You should be able to see through it. So if it is cloudy, it's usually a denotion of infection because of the white blood cells or the presence of bacteria and yeast that are actually in the urine. Now, if you have urine that comes in and all of a sudden it has a head, like a bit of beer, and you're thinking, why on earth is it foamy on top? Most of the time, you are going to find the presence of glucose or protein within, it, within that urine. Okay, so that's what makes it foamy. So always do your general observation. Help set the picture for whilst you, um, while you wait your 30 seconds before you can actually start taking the numbers down. The first area we're going to look at is, well, essentially the biggest non-specific one. Okay, funny to say that because it is specific gravity. Okay, this one essentially sets the sets the tone for everything else to come. Okay, so specific gravity is a means of testing how much solute there actually is dissolved within the urine. So if you had distilled water, the specific gravity would be one, so 1.000. The amount of solute dissolved into that urine obviously increases the specific gravity itself. Now, normal colour for urine, as mentioned before, should be straw or amber. Now, I know the military is famous for those things on the walls that gives you a gradient, and they say that if it's absolutely clear and transparent, then you're fully hydrated and it's good. And okay, whilst, generally speaking, it can mean that you're not dehydrated, it does not translate to meaning that you are good to go. So if you were to have diuretics, alcohol, caffeine, coke, Pepsi, anything like that that often gets consumed in masses outfield, the person can actually urinate clear and dehydrate themselves through urinating clear. Okay, if a person is taking supplements like creatine monohydrate, glutamine, okay, in huge doses, that can also completely dilute the urine as well and you'll have a really low specific gravity. So don't take a decrease number as a gospel good thing. In some cases, it can mean that the person has things like uh, acute glomerulonephritis or they could have diabetes insipidus. Okay? In fact, if you were to test diabetes insipidus and you would have them not eat or drink any water for 12 hours, and the specific gravity was under your 1.02 zero, then you pretty much got a good case that the person has uh, generalised renal impairment or diabetes in, in syphilis. Okay, so a decreased specific gravity is not always a good thing. The normal numbers where you're looking for is around uh, the 005 to 010 number. Okay, down the lower end. So they're the normal ones. Now specifically it should be 007, 0010, okay, because that's actually the Bowman space range, but 05 is, um, is fine. Now, when we talk about an, an increased um, specific gravity, realistically, we're looking past the chart that actually gives us before it gives us an actual real indication of if something is going wrong, okay, outside of general dehydration, which will get you up to the 25s and 30s. Once you get beyond that, so beyond 35, it actually becomes clinically significant. Okay, so the way we use specific gravity within the dipsticks is a means of sometimes explaining why there are traces of certain of the other elements or why the other, other elements are higher. Okay, so a high specific gravity can often give us false positives for the other ones. Okay, a truly problem with the specific gravity is beyond our range. So if you think the specific gravity is much higher than this range goes, then obviously send it off to the laboratory and they can get a much more clearer number. The pH is another one that is generalised uh, with the actual beer analysis. So a normal range 
can easily be like 5.5 to 6.5, okay, down the lower end, okay, but some people can have normal, so absolutely nothing wrong with them, normal range from 4.5 all the way up to 8, and that can be considered normal to them based on their diet, their metabolism, all that sort of thing, okay, so it's very difficult to look at pH alone and determine if there's a problem or not. Okay, so what the pH is testing is obviously the presence of free-flowing hydrogen ions within the urine. Okay, if you have a really low pH, so it's acidic, it's generally associated with a high protein diet and fruits such as cranberry. Pretty much solves the problems of why they recommend you drink cranberry, okay, if you have alkaline urine, okay, or UTI. That's that's where that comes from. Okay, but it can also be much more sinister than that. That's a generally can also mean that they have systemic acidosis, which you'll be able to test a few more things. Uh, diabetes mellitus, starvation, any any malabsorption type thing, or pretty severe diarrhea can also cause quite acidic urine. Okay, diarrhea because it strips the body of all the bicarbonates, leaving nothing to soak up the hydrogen ions, and you end up with acidic urine. The other end of the spectrum, if you have a high pH, that's usually associated with vegetarian diets, okay, or people that have a low carbohydrate diet, lots of vegetables, low carbohydrate, and lots of citrus fruit, believe it or not, okay, because while citrus fruit is, yes, it's acidic, as it digests, it actually leaves what's known as an alkaline ash. So if you're eating a lot of oranges, or a lot of citrus fruit, you can actually end up with quite alkaline based urine. Worst case scenario, it can be a sign of a urinary tract infection and it's only associated with the bacteria that generally use urea as a um, source of energy. Okay, And of course your systemic alkalosis. The numbers of the pH can uh, give you false positives and negatives with some of the other elements that we're testing which we'll get to later on. Protein. Pretty much from day one People have said that having protein in your urine is not normal. Okay, protein molecule is so huge that it cannot fit, possibly fit through the actual glomerulus head, and therefore it should never ever be in your urine. Well, that's that's crap. Okay, protein is normally found in the urine, just in really small amounts. So we're talking 10 milligrams per hundred. Okay, and that's denoted in the colour thing as, as a negative because because that's normal. Okay, so it is normal to excrete proteins, just to clear that furphy straight up. Right, what this particular protein uh, test in the urinalysis is testing is the presence of albumin. So if you have a high concentration of other proteins that you want to test, then this particular urinalysis cannot be used. So just remember that this is really only detecting your albumin levels. Okay, and your albumin levels, yes, they're one of the most common proteins to be excreted, okay, but just be in mind that it's not testing all of it. The presence of protein can essentially denote um, a lot of maybe an increased glomerulus filtration, okay, so you actually have a, a disease within the, the glomerular as well, uh, increased renal tubule secretions, things like that, but it can be also as simple as if you have albinuria, it can be associated with having a mild fever, okay, or exposure to cold. Even stress has been known to give you that, okay. And in trauma situations, the presence of shock can actually give you uh, protein in the urine as well because of the concentration of albumin within the urine, okay. Uh, and in extreme cases, if you're exercising a lot that can also result in albumin being excreted in much higher levels within the urine. So just keep those sort of things in mind. Sometimes it can be quite bad, other times it can be minor and be able to explain pretty well. You can get a false positive uh, if your specific gravity is concentrated. Okay, Because obviously if you've got less um, water, if for lack of a better term, less liquid to dilute these solutes, then the small presence of normal amount of back of protein excretion now in concentration can picked up to be abnormal, so 30 plus that sort of thing. 
Okay, and in contrast, if you have a really low specific gravity, you can get a false negative. Okay, because you've got a whole bunch of water and it's diluting the urine. Okay, it's also the case uh, if you have acidic urine, you can get a false negative. Same as if you have an alkaline urine, you can get a false positive for protein. So just keep those in the back of your mind and that's how the two before relate pretty closely to protein. If you are concerned, as mentioned all before, if you think there's another protein at play, then always send it off to laboratory for testing. Next cab off the rank is everyone's favorite, leukocytes. This is the one that people get wrong all the time because they can't be asked waiting the two minutes in order to get a result. Okay, so that's why it's the last one tested because it's the one that takes the longest in order to get your results. So what this particular test is testing is the presence of whole or lies, so already gone through phagocytosis, of leukocytes. Okay, so it's testing the presence of your white blood cells. Okay. Now it's often associated the presence of white blood cells means that there's an infection in the urine, in, sorry, in the bladder, in the urinary tubes, in the kidneys, whatever it is, there's some form of infection. Okay. But 20% of cases can be negative for a actual uh, UTI when in fact they have a UTI. Okay. So 20% meaning one in five people can be misdiagnosed just using the dipstick itself as a, a guide. So just keep that in the back of your mind. It's not the best and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, further. So you can get false, false positives, okay, and the false positives and false negatives are more associated with females. So a false positive can occur just from the mere presence of normal bacterial flora within the vagina, okay? So that can occur. It can also be a false positive if they're eating any foods or drugs that give the urine a red appearance, okay? It doesn't, doesn't pick it up, the staining gives it a false positive. Okay, false negatives are associated with a low bacterial count within a UTI and women because of the shortened urethra, they generally have a lower amount of bacteria uh, within that urethra, therefore lower amount of leukocytes and you can get that false negative. That's most of the time where it comes from and also the current use of um, antibiotics and if you have again a high specific gravity you can get a false negative to leukocytes. Okay, so seeing a trend, if you have a high specific gravity, take everything else afterwards within a grain of salt. Now, nitrites. Throughout the time, nitrites have been used more in order to denote the presence of a UTI. Okay, the reason is, is nitrites are produced from nitrates within the urine, okay, and they're converted to nitrites if there's a presence of mostly gram-negative bacteria, but it's some gram-positive bacteria. Okay, so the bacteria actually uses the nitrates, and as a byproduct, releases the nitrites. Okay, now if you have a positive test for nitrites, then you're pretty much 95% sensitive to actually have a UTI. Okay, so that's pretty good. So positive test, pretty clear that it's actually going to be a UTI. But a negative test can be 70% sensitive, not too bad, but all the way down to 20, 25% sensitivity as well for a negative test, which is another way of saying that if you get a negative, it doesn't mean they don't have a UTI. If they don't have leukocytes, it doesn't mean they don't have a UTI. If you don't find nitrates, it doesn't mean they don't have a UTI. Okay, a massive uh, study was done on UTI tests and sensitivities, where it was the dipstick right through to the actual um, laboratory analysis. And surprisingly, the sign and symptom that had the highest specificity to it was patient gestalt. Okay, and that's another way of saying that the patient felt like they had a UTI. And if the patient felt that, then they had the highest probability of actually being true. Okay. That's just what this particular study came up with. Okay, so what we should take from that is well, one, always listen to patients. Okay, and two, negative results in leukocytes and nitrites does not mean that they do not have a UTI.
Okay, so if you feel and the patient feels that they could, take it for further testing. Right. Next one is blood. Now, blood's not normal. Okay, having blood in the urine is not normal. So this, the dip test, stick test does both hemolyzed and non-hemolyzed tests. So it's actually two tests in one. Now the difference is non-hemolyzed is your full red blood cells because it means they haven't been broken down. Now hemolyzed are your destroyed red blood cells. So they've either gone through trauma, been punched through the glomerulus or what have you. Okay, red blood cells aren't gonna fit through it normally. So if they get forced through it by some form of pathology, then they're going to be broken up. Okay, usually associated with trauma, infection, inflammation, uh, calculus, cancers, all that sort of stuff. You, you'll get the presence of mostly hemolyzed red blood cells. Okay, so anything associated with renal problems, you'll generally get hemolyzed. Non-hemolyzed can mean that you have some form of ulcer or growth or something like that on your actual uh, urinary tract, and that's what's allowing full red blood cells full um, through, and then you get your non-hemolyzed. Okay, now presence of um, myoglobin, so obviously the connection site of oxygen found in muscle. So if you have muscle breakdown, the presence of myoglobin can also show up as a positive within in this test. Okay, now regardless of all the difference, hemolyzed, non-hemolyzed, myoglobin or not. If you get a positive in blood, it needs further investigation. Okay, I don't think I really need to say that, but there you go, I just threw it out there anyway. So if you don't remember the difference, you don't remember what's causing it, you see trace or small amounts positives, then send it on for further investigation. Okay, ketones, obviously the result of incomplete fat metabolism. Okay, what happens is they accumulate in the plasma and essentially they're excreted within the urine. So ketouria is usually associated with um, your low carbohydrate, people that eat high fats, high protein diets, you know, ketogenesis or whatever the f they call it, those sort of diets. Uh, but it is also a form of starvation. Star people who are starving also have ketones in the urine. People who are diabetic definitely have, have ketones in the urine and alcoholism or hypothyroidism okay so it's not a good thing sure ask about someone's diet but it can mean pretty significant things ketones it's usually a form of abnormal metabolism of fats and presence in the urine is not considered normal now glucose most people get glucose okay glucose is um, pretty well understood in the urine. So it's not it's not supposed to be there. Okay, so there will be traces, like really, really small amounts of glucose found in your urine, but pretty much they're, they're non-detectable. Okay, so I think I read that it was like 100, less than 130 milligrams of, sh of glucose in the, in the entire 24 hour period of filtration. Okay, so really, really small amounts of actual glucose presence. So when you get glucose, it's obvious that it's come from uh, someone who has a lot of glucose in their blood. Okay, that's generally the reason it comes from. So if you have a high serum glucose level, you're going to get glucose. Okay, but it can be associated with a whole myriad of drugs, which I'm not going to go into, so just look at the drugs that, that they're on, because uh, it can be associated with that as well as well as obviously renal disease and pregnancy. Okay. Now, the way glucose gets into your urine, what normally happens is glucose does pass into the actual glomerulus, goes through the filtration track. Okay. So if anyone tells you glucose is too big to pass through, they're also misinformed. So glucose can indeed pass through, but then during the reabsorption phase on the loop, it literally has harpoon type things that will shoot out, bind to the actual glucose sites and pull them back in. So normal amounts of glucose, normal amounts of filtration, all normal function, they have enough harpoon sites to draw the glucose back in. If there is damage to these harpoons or if there is an increased presence of glucose, the harpoons are essentially going to miss. It's not going to be able to shoot them all. So you still pick up its normal amount, but the excess will go through. Therefore, you'll have presence of glucose within 
your actual urine. And the last one is probably the most misunderstood, which is your bilirubin and your urobilogen. Okay, now these two are really, really closely linked. Okay, so bilirubin is uh, the product of essentially red blood cells degradation. So as red blood cells die, they go through the liver for processing and then they get processed by the liver, put into through the bilinary duct into the actual intestinal wall and then they get broken up into different chemicals. One of those chemicals is urobilogen okay, and that is mostly excreted in feces but it can in traces be excreted by the kidney as well. Okay, so we'll talk more about that one second. So bilirubin comes from the kidney into the bilinary duct. Now if there's any problem associated with the kidney or the breakdown, oh, sorry, not the breakdown of red blood cells, but the actual transfer of bilirubin into the actual digestive system through the bilinary duct, then you're going to have an increase of bilirubin within the blood and therefore an increase of bilirubin within the urine. Now, bilirubin is associated with jaundice. So everyone knows jaundice, the yellow complexion, but the presence of bilirubin in the urine can be detected before the signs of jaundice are present. Okay, so it's a good thing to test for. And it is not normal to find bilirubin in the actual urine. So if you find it, it needs definitely needs further investigation. Okay, your urobilogen like I said, is the breakdown of that bilirubin. And what happens with that is it essentially gets converted from bilirubin uh, in the presence of the uh, intestinal bacteria uh, in the duodenum, in case you care, okay? But most of that urobilogen gets processed through, it just gets processed through with the rest of the feces and it goes back, okay? But some of it gets transferred back into the liver. Okay, and it's converted into part of the actual bile that goes through the bilinary duct. So that's the normal process. Now, as it gets transported back to the liver, some of it stays in the bloodstream, and therefore you have like a less than 1% filtration rate of the actual urobilogen that you'll find in your urine. Okay, so finding it in the urine, as you can see on the form, 0.2 to 1 is normal because it's a normal process to find it. If you find a huge amount, then it's generally associated with hepatic diseases or a hemolytic disease as well. So the way to use these two together, bilirubin should be negative, okay? Because bilirubin is supposed to just shoot in through the bilinary duct into the digestive tract and then essentially gets broken down and that's it. Goodbye bilirubin. That's what's supposed to happen. So it's never supposed to be in the blood. It's never supposed to be in urine. Urobilogen should be found in urine uh, in small amounts. So what's considered normal on the, on the test. If you have a positive bilirubin negative urobilogen, then you have a bilinary duct obstruction. So gallstones, that sort of thing. Uh, the reason for that is, is if the bilirubin can't get in to the duodenum, then it can't be broken down into urobilogen, therefore urobilogen will be negative. Okay, so you won't actually have anything in there. Okay, so that's obviously needs to be detected by a lab, but you will have presence of bilirubin, as opposed to things like hepatic diseases where you'll find positives for both, but your hemolytic diseases, you'll actually find an increase of urobilogen, but a negative test for the bilirubin. Okay, so that's how those two work together and that's how we can use them to our advantage to sort of get an idea of what's happening in the body. No, it's not diagnostic, okay, but it's definitely suggestive. So suggestive enough to get further tests and get the person help. So that's urinalysis. Okay, dipstick urinalysis analysis in a nutshell. So things that really need to keep in mind is it is a screening tool, a 100% screening tool. It has a huge failure rate within itself and a five to 10% failure rate across the entire board. And it's even higher failure rate if people keep doing the test the way they're doing it, okay? Which is essentially too quick, too slow, pointless, okay? So it's a screening tool. If done correctly, can be very, very useful, okay? But 
as we've already detected, is not very useful in UTI detection. If you have positive nitrites, great, okay, really high specificity, but if it's negative, we need further testing. When you finish getting all the numbers, sit back and think about it. Think about what the patient's told you, think about the patient's diet and their overall metabolic status, and get a picture of how the urinalysis fits into place. And until next time, take care.